after Shmuel, after Shaul, excuse me, had successfully <coughs> won battle and now was coronated publicly for a second time, we begin with um, his reign. And there's a verse here which makes very little sense, and it seems to be there's some textual problems. Ben Shana Shaul Bimalcho, which literally means Shaul was one years old when he became king. Ushteshan in Malach Yisrael. And he reigned for two years. Now, both of those phrases are actually really problematic. A, he clearly was not one years old. So the rabbinic commentary, he was one years old. He was pure of sin, like a baby. Um, seems to be there's a, a couple words missing there, but it probably means in the first year of his reign. So we're really early in his reign. It's clear from his stories, he also doesn't reign for two years. It's got to be more than that. The whole story, the whole episode with Dovid and chasing Dovid around, it, it's got to be more than two years. And uh, there's an explanation uh, from some scholars recently who say, if you look um, throughout the book of Kings, there are a number of kings who are described as reigning for two years. I believe you're Ravan ben Nevat and others. I can't remember them all off the top of my head. And they're all kings whose reigns are not great. And so here, too, it seems to be that what it's saying is that Shaul was an unsuccessful king by saying it was two years. But let's see if he has any success. So Saul picked 3,000 men, 2,000 were with him in the place called Michmash, uh, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in the hills of, of Benjamin, and the rest of them all went home. Obviously, there could have been many more, talked about uh, many more people in the last uh, chapter, but for, for whatever reason now, those are the only number that he has. Yonatan, you know, Yonatan is is the son of Shaul. It doesn't mention him here as being the son, it just mentions him as, as an aside. So, um, Yonatan is a great hero. So Jonathan strikes down the Philistine uh, fort in, in Geva. When the Philistines hear about it, and Shaul uh, blows the ram's word to get the army to keep moving. Let the Hebrews hear. Let, the, let us hear and let us pass through. Avar to pass. Ivrim, pass. Let us pass through their, let's pass through their army is what... Um, is what we is what they say here. So they're they're right. And interestingly, maybe the reason why Yonatan is not mentioned by name here, uh, or is not mentioned by title, is mentioned by name. Doesn't say he's the crown prince. Doesn't say he's the son of Shaul. Is that this chapter we'll see is undercutting and undermining in many ways the kingship. And so let's we'll we'll catch that back in 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 a little bit. But that may be part of the reason why he's not mentioned that way. When Israel heard about the, the defeat of the uh, Philistine fort, and here it said Saul had struck it, even though it was obviously not Saul, it was the son Yonatan. And then um, right B'nai Israel came out and, and they rallied to, to Saul to defeat the Philistine. The Philistines, in turn, they gather 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, so they have a huge army, and they march up to the encampment at Michmas. And when the middle of Israel saw that there were <laughs> such a large Philistine army, they got scared. So they went into hiding. They hid in caves and in, in bushes and rocks and tunnels and cysts, wherever they could hide because they're terrified. Some Hebrews crossed over even into the Jordan River. But Shaul remained in Gilgal, uh, which is near the, the river, and the rest of the people rallied to him in alarm. So some people are running away, some people are hiding. The term usually used for uh, for the Israelites in this book is not Ivrim, usually it's Israel, but part of the reason it seems to be is using Avar here. A, they could pass through the army of the Philistines, or B, what they could do is they can Avar, they can cross over the Jordan in fear and run away, and at least some of them, that is what they have done. Continuing verse 8. So if we remember back in chapter uh, 10, after Shmuel said to Shaul, you're going to be the next king of Israel, following that, 
he tells him to wait for me for seven days in, in, in Gilgal. So Shmuel, this is presumably what he was talking about. Shaul is waiting for seven days for Shmuel to, to arrive. Shaul, he and uh, so the people, what happens is, is in the end of, I don't know if I read, in the end of the last Pasuk, the people start scattering there. Well, what's going on? What are we waiting for? What's happening? Who's leading us? Who's in charge? Is God going to be with us? How are we going to defeat? And they start to, even more of them, start to disappear, start to scatter. And so Shaul says, So Shaul says, it's time for the sacrifices. We have the sacrifices now. Um, then, you know, we're going to be uh, entreating God and God hopefully will listen to us and we will defeat the Philistines. And um, in classic fashion, the second after the sacrifices, which Shmuel told Shaul to wait until he arrives to sacrifice them, the second after uh, they're sacrificed, Shmuel shows up, Shaul comes to greet him, to bless him. Vayomer Shmuel. Saul says, you know, I, I waited for you for seven days. You didn't arrive. The people started to scatter. I needed to bring the sacrifices. That's what I needed to do, maybe to, again, entreat God, get God on their side. There are other opinions that say sacrifices here are being used because sometimes sacrifices are used in advance of getting prophecy. So, for example, Bilam, right, before he gets his prophecy, which he thinks is going to curse Israel, and of course, he blesses them, he brings numerous sacrifices. So maybe here the sacrifices were supposed to be to get God to appear to them and to tell them how they should fight, what they should do. By Va'amar. So continue with his uh, talk here in verse 12. So I thought the Philistines would march down against me before I had, right, asked God for, for help. And so I brought the burnt offerings. Shmuel says to Shul, Shaul, you acted foolishly. You didn't keep God's commandment that God had laid upon you, or if you would have, you your dynasty could have lasted forever. But now your dynasty will not endure. God wanted somebody with right to who 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 would have his, the heart, his heart would be like the heart of God, and God appointed him over as ruler of his people, but you didn't do what, what God asked you. And this uh, seems to be what Shaul does here is, is very minimal. He offers sacrifice without waiting. Is that such a big deal? He doesn't wait for, for Shmuel. And that's why I said earlier, mentioned earlier, that there was a saying that this chapter is undercutting the idea of the monarchy. Shmuel, yes, he kisses Shaul at first when he makes him king. In some ways, he seems to love Shaul and is, is very disappointed by, by Shaul's career. But why does he show up late? And what mitzvah of God is he referring to? Shmuel told him to wait for seven days for him. Is that a mitzvah of God? Is that something that Shaul is not showing that he's worshiping God? Interestingly, when we read this chapter, it reminds us, I think all of us of the chapter of the Egel Hazav, of the golden calf, where B'nai Yisrael there also didn't wait for a long enough time. Moshe comes, or, and there it's much worse. There, there, right? The, here, Shaul's trying to communicate with God. There they are, uh, whether it's a full-fledged idolatry or it's just using a medium, there it's a, a much greater sin. It's, uh, uh, strangely, however, with the Shaul sort of painted as our own here, our own is allowed to become the head of the dynasty, the head of the Kohanim, where Shaul here is not allowed. It's taken away from him. Continuing in verse 15, Shmuel arose, he goes up from Gilgal, he goes back to territory of Binyamin, and Shmuel looks at the troops, and there are about 600 of them. So Jonathan and Saul, and there's only 600 now. The army keeps being depleted. They are in the Geva and Binyamin, and the Philistines, as we previously said, are in Michmas. And so raiders come out from the Philistine camp. One column heads to Ofra, the road that leads towards the land of Shaul. This is a different Shaul. It's spelled differently. It's not his name. 
um, as you say, Shual, it's not Shaul, Shual, Varosh Echad Yifna Derech Beit Choron, Varosh Echad Yifna Derech Hagvul, Anishkaf Al Geat Tzvaim, Hamid Barah. Another column headed for Beit Choron, a third headed for, for the border road but towards the Valley of Tzvaim. So they're sending out their advanced troops, their raiders, to come in to begin with, with uh, um, sort of mercenary attacks to, to start um, attacking B'nai Yisrael. That's what the Philistines are doing. Becharash lo yimsa bechol Eretz Yisrael. And here's part of the problem, is that there was no smith to be found in all the land of Israel. Because the Philistines were afraid that the Hebrews would make swords or spears. So when Bnei Israel, when they wanted to uh, to, to be able to buy plowshares or axes or, or all sorts of different um, tools in order to farm, they had to go. The Philistines had better um, technology. And because of that, they had greater weapons. They didn't allow B'nai Israel to, to, when they would come down with their, with their metal or whatever, they wouldn't let them uh, use it to make spears and swords. They could use it to make a, to make a, you know, a, a sickle or something. And so the Philistines have greater technology, and therefore they have a great advantage in this battle, in this war. B'nai Israel's great hope is God. But now God doesn't seem to be with B'nai Israel. So, okay, continuing here in verse 21, by Tapsira. Pim lemacharash lemachareshout uleitim ule shalosh kilshon va ule hakar dumim latziva dabran. And so when they had to charge it, they're right. They they could when they had to sharpen, I should say, they had to sharpen their instruments. That's where they had to go, and so they could sharpen. But again, they don't have any swords. They don't have any spears. Vayabiyom chemet velo nimsa cher vechanit biyad kolam asher et shaul ve yonatan ve tzimsa le shaul ve yonatan blo. You know, and on the day of the battle, there are only two people who have swords and spears as the battle is about to happen, and that is Saul and his son Yonatan. Everybody else, you know, maybe they have an axe. Axe sounds pretty good. Maybe they have a, a rake or something. And so it seems very troubling, very problematic. Continue with the last verse. Vayetse matzah plishtim el ma'avar mechmas. The Philistine gathering, garrison had marched out past Michmas, they're starting, they sent out the original raiders, and now they're continuing to go into battle to attack Shaul and Yonatan, to attack the Israelite army, who <coughs> so many of them have scattered, they're chireid, they're terrified, they're scared, and even the ones who remain, we don't know if God's on our side. Shmuel came, disappeared, we didn't hear any words from God. What is going to happen? And so there seems to be that there's a great worry, a great fear. Shaul had an original great battle against Nachash Moni. He was enveloped with the spirit of God and was able to defeat them. But here things look pretty bleak for Shaul. And what did he do wrong? It's hard to say. It's hard to really understand what he did wrong. Classical understanding is that it demonstrates his lack of leadership qualities. He's, he's appeasing the people. He should be saying to them, I'm in charge and you need to wait. Is that a reason for him to be uh, screamed at by Shmuel? I don't know. That's a good question. And I don't think anybody has a wonderful answer. We'll continue tomorrow as the battle proceeds. Will B'nai Israel be routed or will, because they have a king, as God has told them, will they be able to defeat the Philistines?